And our next speaker is Annie Donahue from USDA ARS in Fayetteville, Arkansas. And she'll be talking about organic poultry, developing natural solutions for reducing pathogens and improving production. So, welcome. Thank, Thank you. you, Jim. Um, yeah, it's really a pleasure to be here, uh, and, and it's nice to have a group uh, talking about some of the issues with livestock and poultry. And um, just to give you a little background about why we started working on this, I had the opportunity to take over as our uh, research leader for the Dale Bumper Small Farm Research uh, Unit in Boonville. And many of you may know Joan Burke. She's a research scientist, works on small ruminant production. And she was developing really one of the only ARS certified um, pasture programs for small ruminants. So she's doing a lot of work with uh, parasite uh, challenges with animals, looking at different forages, and also uh, trying to look at some of the genetics in, in some of these small ruminants. So. I had always known about Jim and what he had done and kind of thought, well, there's a big group of folks working on organic uh, work with poultry. So back at our uh, UNS, I started to look into it. It really shocked me at how very little work was done. There was nothing on e-organic. There was really nothing in poultry, except for you know the companies that are working and a lot of folks that are sort of doing peripheral things. So really, we were very appreciative of the organic research um, a grant program. Uh, we put together basically a group of folks from all over the country that are working on some of the issues for organic poultry. And it's just the start. There's so much more to do, um, but we're, we're very, very appreciative. And it's really programs like that that's allowed us to do that and to start to add to some of the work that Jim's done and some of his folks um, uh, previous to us. So this is a really uh, very big area of um, growth for the poultry industry. It's a good uh, area for folks that are interested in organics, especially if they're moving from vegetables into birds, they can start slowly and kind of build up their programs um, as they transition. So in pretty much all the sectors, and a lot of the folks that we do training with, with beginning farmers um, on the coast and sort of in the uh, larger cities in the Midwest, there is a lot, there's a really high premium um, on organic uh, produce and uh, uh, product. Um, we've had some of our farmers that are selling eggs in Florida for uh, organic eggs for $20 a dozen and in New York as well. Um, and they can't keep them on the shelves, uh, particularly duck eggs too. So there's there's a lot of uh, a lot of opportunity here that we just really aren't um, hitting. One of the, uh, the, the things when we're, we're moving into poultry is that this act, outdoor access does cause um, more of a challenge. If you think about what conventional poultry producers did, they brought birds into houses so that they could keep all of those um, factors that may be uh, vectors out of their birds. So now we're kind of going a bit the other way. Um, there's some very, very good literature um, showing the ability to keep some pathogens out just by keeping the flies out. Um, but you can't really do that when you're trying to work with outdoor access. So we do have some unique challenges. Of course, we don't, um, in, in the organic uh, arena, uh, use any of the uh, antibiotic growth prom uh, promoters or other drugs are kept limited. Um, and so there are some things that have been used that kind of really change the microbiota of uh, the chicken enteric system and uh, that, that have been keenly used to keep disease down. So. Uh, these really offer us opportunities to kind of look at some of the research. Um, and as I mentioned, there was really not much on the organic when, when we started. So if we look at some of the food safety implications, um, a lot of folks, uh, just even in the U.S., uh, we don't even look at some of the third world countries, are affected by foodborne illness. Everybody in this uh, room has probably um, had the opportunity to relate to that, uh, to some of the issues with that. And poultry, meat, and eggs are a common vehicle uh, for transmission. Salmonella and Campylobacter are the leading causes of foodborne illness in the U.S. and the epidemiological evidence um, really indicates that poultry products are a significant source of this human illness. Um, so what happens a lot of times, at least in the meat, uh, it, the, it's very, it can, these uh, pathogens can be very high in the enteric system and when they go through slaughter um, that's how we get the cross-contamination and we're not doing a very good job of um, either cleaning or keeping the meat separate from other uh, uh, sources of food or even if, you know, when we're out eating uh, in restaurants and the folks that are uh, preparing our food sometimes it might not be quite as clean as we think. So one of the things that's really kind of interesting in birds is that 
a lot of the foodborne pathogens that we're talking about don't cause disease in birds. At high levels they can, or if you have a very susceptible early um, stage challenge, it, it might, but like for example, Campylobacter, 500 cells exposure to human will cause a pretty significant um, disease in, in humans for that short period of time, diarrhea, vomiting, that sort of thing. But 10 to the 4th up to 10 to the 8th uh, Campylobacter in a young chick, we may not see any disease at all. It's fascinating how these bacteria really evolved with our birds. Uh, and so even the, the processes of what we call commensal, which is when they kind of just, did, where they're sort of a natural, like, be able to cohabitate uh, with the bird, the commensal bacteria, they trigger different things than necessarily what we would have with a, with a pathogenetic um, invasion. So in the birds, and a lot of times a lot of lizards, and we'll talk about, this is sort of the focus, is the cica. This is an area in the intestine where there's a, a high level of bacteria, and, and that's where we see the highest amount of Campylobacter and Salmonella in birds. Um, they, it will be throughout the, the um, enteric tract, but that's really sort of the focus. Oops, let me go back one. Let's see. Okay, so there's been, a, there's been some research looking into the prevalence of foodborne pathogens in both conventional and organic poultry and kind of comparing the two. And sometimes it's lower in some of these studies, sometimes it's higher, sometimes it's not, not the same, you know. But I think for us really the question is, this is not really our major question, maybe the question we should be asking. Our real question is, if it's going to be there, if this is naturally occurring in birds, regardless of how we're growing them, we need to find ways and strategies to reduce this so that we reduce the human health issue. So I think one of the biggest points for us, and this is sort of a process as we've kind of become more involved with it, when we think of organic production, we've heard it the last couple of days, is it a way to improve the overall health and the environment? And there's a lot of things that are not allowed in organic production. But does this translate into people feeling that this is a, this safety is actually a safe a safeguard for for um, uh, foodborne pathogens? So uh, a lot of surveys show that that people consume organic uh, food because they think it's healthier. Um, but I think one of the things that we're really concerned about is that there is a perceived indication that that means they don't have any foodborne pathogens on them. So is there actually a higher risk of people abusing that or when they buy organic meat they think, oh well, I can leave it sitting out of the refrigerator for an extra hour, uh, hour because I know Dave grew, grew it on his farm and he doesn't have any pathogens. So and I'm, <laughs> and I'm so targeting you, but but I think we have that, and and I've actually seen that quite a bit, um, particularly even in farmers markets and things like that. That that even some of the farmers believe that just the way they're they're producing it, that we're not seeing that potential. So um, you know, this is something we really need to kind of be aware of and to really sort of target um, keeping those pathogens sort of off of our our meats and uh, potential food products. So one of the biggest points here I want to make is that um, there's been some studies that have shown even a two log reduction in Campylobacter on poultry carcasses or poultry products could lead to a 30 fold decrease in, in disease in humans. So if we can make uh, some you know, impact both on the animal or even in the product, we can have a really big impact on the food safety of people. So this is our group. We have a really large group of um, folks that have been working on our organic project. Um, I'm just going to kind of key on some of the research that uh, we're doing in our unit along with the University of Arkansas and uh, University of Connecticut. We've had a long-term research collaboration with them. And uh, you'll be interested at University of Minnesota just hired a new Colin Johnny who is fabulous scientist, uh, worked with, with us for years and is continuing as a collaborator. So it's nice you guys have um, him here to maybe develop some collaborations with as well. So this is kind of our focus to use some of these natural strategies to uh, reduce foodborne uh, pathogens. And we try to look at things that are grass. So these are um, generally recognized as safe by FDA so we don't have to worry about trying to get through some of the regulations that can be uh, pretty substantial when you're trying to make a claim. Um, that they may provide a good substitute 
to changing the environment in the gut to improve the chances of sort of knocking out uh, some of these pathogens um, available to live in that environment. They need to be affordable and they have these natural antimicrobial properties. So one uh, project that, product that we've looked at pretty significantly is caprylic acid. This is a medium chain fatty acid. It's found in breast milk, um, bovine milk, and coconut oil. When we use it and kind of actually do some closed in studies, when you take some of the, um, the uh, samples out, you can kind of get that tropical smell when you're working on things. So, um, so there, are, there are some things we have to worry about with uh, taste, but um, uh, it is, uh, it's very effective and it's, um, it's fairly inexpensive. Oops, oh, I didn't mean to zip through that. Maybe I did. Um, so anyway, we've done actually quite a few studies. Um, Let's see if that will, whoops, it doesn't really want to go back. Let's see. Uh, let's see. I hate to hit that we got previous. Does the up arrow take you back? Oh, maybe. Yeah. Let's try it. Okay, there. good. Oh, you're perfect. Okay, thanks. Um, so, <laughs> I was trying to do it on the on the pad instead. So we've done a lot of work um, showing that Campylobacter can be reduced in the lab. Um, with caprylic acid, and then we've done a series of studies. We do both prophylactic and therapeutic studies. So trying to give the um, the product before the birds get exposed and those that, that are given afterwards. Uh, therapeutics are really difficult, especially even salmonella. It's really hard once you get a bird colonized to actually knock it out. So um, it, it's a bit of a challenge to do that. Let me try to go forward with that. Okay, so um, these are just some of the studies we've done where we um, this is a pro prophylactic experiment where we feed for uh, a period of time here, 10 days. We challenge with Campylobacter, making sure the birds are not colonized before, and then uh, check the, sam uh, the enteric um, content to see if um, Campylobacter is actually present. So here's some of the first studies we did. Um, so here's <coughs> Campylobacter concentration. This is in the cecum, that part of the intestine I was showing you positive controls over four trials and then two different doses of caprylic acid and we see some variation but we do see um, a bit of a of a knockdown with the caprylic acid um, yeah this is in the seco so this is the amount of campylobacter that we can when we enumerate um, in the lab after we take out the the seco the intestinal portion of the bird. Uh, were you saying the caprylic acid is a percent, that's percent in diet? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's in the diet. Um, with caprylic acid, we've done several studies. Um, it would be nicer to be able to give it in water because it would be more convenient, but with the compounds that we've used, we've not found it efficacious, so we're having to mix it in with the feed, but that seems to work pretty well. This is a similar study, but now looking therapeutically where we just give the uh, caprylic acid um, towards the end of the trial and then uh, look at whether we can knock down the challenge. And this is actually pretty significant where you get a very strong uh, effective log reduction um, with using Campylobacter. And again, we've done these tests now in market age birds. So we start with the chicks, see if we can see efficacy because it's kind of expensive. Not you folks that work with cows or pigs, but to, to do enough birds to make it you know, worthwhile to look at that. So again, we've seen some pretty good um, efficacy there. This is some work of um, um, Anoop uh, that when he was working in Kumar's lab at University of Connecticut. Um, and again, showing the same sort of thing with salmonella. So we're actually being able to see um, after a given time of feeding the uh, caprylic acid that we can knock down uh, the food safety pathogens. So we've been looking at now several others. So sort of our idea is that um, a lot of these pathogens are, you know, trying to evolve in different ways in the in the enteric system. Well, the systems that we want to use that are antimicrobial, um, they need to have maybe different ways of effectively knocking these out. So whether it's being able to penetrate the the membrane of the um, bacteria, if they can change the energy. Um, structure or the pathways of the of uh, the bacteria, uh, maybe alter the gene expression of um, some of these um, pathogens in the bird, that that could make a difference. So we've tried to use a lot of different um, 
angles, trying to use different compounds and with the idea of maybe combining some of these that can kind of attack it a different way because we don't want to build that resistance either um, against some of these. So we've tried um, several others. We've done, uh, tried eugenol. We've worked with transcinnamalda quite a bit. This is uh, the main component of um, cinnamon oil. It's very nice when the students are in the lab. It smells very good. Um, feels like you're cooking in the labs instead of uh, um, doing some of the research. Um, again, sort of the same idea uh, where we'll either dose um, uh, with uh, the uh, cinnamaldehyde or eugenol towards the end of, um, of uh, the trial and challenge with salmonella or campylobacter depending on what we're working with a little bit earlier and then look at, uh, at the market age bird and see how we, uh, what the effectiveness is. And again, we are seeing with with several different of these compounds, uh, you know, at least a log or two reduction, which again can have pretty you know significant impact for um, potential human health. When we've looked at um, some of the uh, other organs in these birds, we're not seeing any any effect of giving these um, um, compounds. So we're not seeing any toxic effects um, based on the supplementation. And then this is some work of a student of uh, Kumar's that's actually working on looking at the effects in eggs. So we're seeing that this can actually have a, a pretty significant impact um, on, on eggs. You know, salmonella is uh, transferred quite um, easily into egg products. Um, and this is a study in which she fed uh, transcendamaldehyde over a period of time and after a challenge was really able to significantly reduce um, the amount of salmonella both in the yolks and in the eggs of, um, of uh, layer birds. Um, with some of these compounds it's been very frustrating when we work with Campylobacter. Campylobacter has a little bit different niche than salmonella um, and this is kind of a typical thing with Campylobacter studies in birds. A lot of times we'll have you know, trial work. Oh, yay, everything worked great. First trial, we get a pretty significant reduction um, in the Campylobacter load in birds. But then another trial it might be variable. On the third trial, we see no effect. So um, we're really having to kind of develop these strategies for each uh, foodborne pathogen separate. What works for Salmonella isn't necessarily going to work um, for, for Campylobacter. Again, we've tried. Uh, yeah. Could you kind of maybe speculate on? Why the differences are so wide? Yeah, I you know um, it it can be a lot of things, but it you know it might be the birds, it might be the age or the you know the early health. There's some indication that maybe the age of the hen when the egg is laid can have an effect on the health of the chick. I mean, there's a lot um, that that can be involved. Um, Fascinating work with, and I just am not going to have time today. There's some very interesting work as far as why we think salmonella and Campylobacter are different too, because Campylobacter is uh, tends to be more modal and gets really into the crypts of the intestinal um, like area. So they kind of dig down into the mucus layer and really feed off of the mucus layer. So there's sort of some different interactions um, going on on there as well. Um, so this is kind of one of the things we see. Uh, this is looking at a couple of plant extracts, thymol and carbacol, um, in looking <coughs> at sequel con contents in the lab. So where it's a little more simplified and we can see really significant reduction in Campylobacter. We can knock it out. So you think, okay, we've solved the problem, right? Um, well, not necessarily. The birds get involved and we start to see some of this interaction. So sometimes we have some of these that have worked really consistently in the lab and then when we get in the real world and start using them in birds, um, we'll have a couple of, of uh, combinations or, or um, practices that might work and others that are not quite as good. And when you're going to get out into the real world and it's very robust, we need something that's going to be pretty consistent. So there are still some challenges there. So we have seen that caprylic acid is um, pretty consistent in reducing salmonella and Campylobacter in chickens, so we know that that um, is probably going to have some good efficacy. Transcendamaldehyde and eugenol are really very good in, um, against salmonella, and sometimes with, with Campylobacter, but we're, we're just not as consistent to feel as comfortable saying that that's a good uh, suggestion there. 
So there are there are other combinations or some things that we are doing that we were hoping that we'll be able to improve on some of these um, things as well. One of the things we've kind of feel is important and really we haven't seen any work on at all um, to any degree is to start to look at post-harvest strategies. So us utilizing some of these essential oils and some of these um, plant molecules in our post-harvest uh, work. So this is actually some work that's going to be presented this summer um, by one of our students, but looking at um, trying some of these different natural compounds and uh, challenging the meat product with Campylobacter or Salmonella and then looking at, at trying some of these different washes and we're seeing some pretty good effect here. So this may actually have um, some long-term benefit but there's quite a bit of work that needs to be done as far as how these pathogens are attaching to uh, the different poultry products and then how some of these um, compounds might be able to uh, reduce them. And we're actually thinking they might even be something we can add to packaging so that not that anybody here would do that, but if you know there's a, there's a chance, just human nature as far as maybe not getting things in the cooler quick enough or maybe as people are preparing things, that if we can kind of reduce that risk, that we can reduce the load as well. As well. Good question. Mm -hmm. You mentioned earlier that, uh, that adding these compounds to water wasn't efficacious in terms of feeding to the birds. What are you using for a carrier in the wash? Are you, are you carrying that through some sort of surfactant or how do you manage that? Uh, that We're kind of working that through. I mean, there's a lot there that needs to be worked out. And that's really kind of another grant. We're hoping that we can uh, actually look at that further. So we're doing some preliminary testing just to see, is it efficacious? Can we do it cheap enough? Um, but it's an excellent question because that's something that's going to need to be need to be worked out. Um, just to put a plug in for eOrganics, um, they've worked really, really well, you know, great with us. And um, Jackie Jacobs, who is part of our grant, has really sort of taken the lead on this part. Um, but there's a lot of um, articles that, that she and Ann Fanatico and some of the other folks in our group have put together and that are now available. So um, those are, are available to everyone and um, also through uh, eExtension as well. So that's been a it's, it's been nice to see sort of that development of some poultry um, things there. And as I said, that's something we're really interested in is to maybe look at some of the post-harvest strategies <coughs> and move these particular uh, looking at some of these natural products in that area. But now there's a whole other part about that as far as making sure they don't change texture, taste, uh, and, and the things that go along with even keeping the product available for longer than, you know, for longer shelf life. So, so there's a lot to be done there, but um, really something that uh, we think needs to be done. So, so you know, some of these uh, uh, trials on the bird, uh, you know, feeding and the compounds, are those in an organic system with outdoor access, like in those pictures you just showed, or are those confined birds? We've that, done both. Sometimes uh -huh. when we're doing the original work, um, we will do that in kind of a, a combined uh, stu you know, study so that we can see if there's efficacy. But we have been doing some work with our, uh, we have a, a past, we have a fixed house with pasture access and then we also have been doing some work um, with some of our farmers. That was kind of the third part of our grant was to, to actually do some application on farm. And it's fun working with farmers and they're great. We have a couple of guys that are, you know, an organic, um, you know, using an organic system. Uh, but things have come up. One of our big studies, we did a spring, summer, fall study, and the year we did that was the year we had 10 days with over 100 degree heat. It, we had to quit. I mean, we just couldn't. The humane part of that study just couldn't happen. But, um, but to answer your question, we're trying to do both. So we start kind of in, the, in kind of a smaller thing first, and then we're trying to move into that. So we are actually our organic certified at, at our research site and so we do, um, we have an old, it's fabulous, Anne Fanatico actually helped um, convert the buildings for us when she was a postdoc with us. Of course she went to Appalachian State and she, and it's, it's perfect for the, some of the work that we're doing because there's good outdoor access, indoor access, and then we can do actually comparisons of what if you give the birds outdoor access versus indoor access. Yeah, along with that, you know, these corn crop cross birds, or what are they? Well, you know, we've done several different things. Sometimes we use the Cornish cross, sometimes we've used some heritage breeds. Um, for a lot of these to start, we're kind of staying with the Cornish cross, but, um, but we've done some pasture trials with some of the 
the uh, So along with what Jim asked me, is, is vigorous grazing uh, beneficial? To, uh, colonization? Well, I think I don't think I can really answer that on the studies we've done with this yet. We did do um, some very, I mean, as, where we used hoop houses, and then we actually, it's crazy for you guys that grow birds this way, but we did hoop houses, and then we boarded up the bottom of the hoop house, so they were in the same environment, but without having the access to the forage. And we did some, we did a pretty significant trial over several um uh, seasons on that. That was not doing anything to the forage. I mean, we didn't we didn't choose forages for the birds. I mean, there's a whole area of research that needs to be done. Right. I think what you're saying is that, you know, and, and we would, we've done some of it, but we, we haven't hit it the way it needs to be done. But I think there's a whole area of looking at how we're doing that. And we actually have some farmers that are working with us that are testing some of that and we're doing some quantitative measures. There's, there's an attitude in the regulatory group crowd that birds forage are more likely to have Campylobacter and somnol colonization just because of the forages. And I don't know if there's any data to support that. I don't think we have data. And the yeah. other issue is, you know, having raised birds, depending on how much you move them, what the access is, what the whole, you know, if you keep birds under a hoop house in the same area <clears> and don't move them every day or every two days, and depending on the amount of space you're giving them, yeah, you can create environments where you're going to have a higher level of um, micro, you know, less diversity or whatever. But um, but we really that's that's there's so many areas. I think all we've done is sort of hit the edge of the iceberg on on what needs to be studied. And and I'm surprised there isn't really a lot in there. But it's kind of we're starting to see that now with a lot of the um, the ruminant species starting to you know where you guys are designing the forages to fit. Uh, what the needs of the animals are, and there's, I think that's completely unexplored with um, poultry. It's interesting. We go out to the to the farms, and certain producers, organic producers, some will say the birds don't touch the grass. We're just doing it because it's part of the regs. Then we have other ones that are convinced that a huge portion of what they're doing is is foraging and eating. A lot of that depends on genetics of birds, as you know, or you know the the time of the year, the type of forage. All that stuff is is a part of complex systems that I think we there's a lot you know for some of these young graduate students that are coming out there's some fun fun projects that that are out there to be explored and there's some very good work with the uh, the the post the pasture poultry group has a quite a bit of information too they're they're very good at providing some of them forages. <laughs>